testimonies are an important part of what we do in Celebrate Recovery. And so we want to bring that hope, that encouragement, that inspiration to you today through a life change story from a brother in Christ who walked in with some pain, faced it, and dealt with the hangups and the negative core beliefs and ultimately uh, got honest about those habits that had him stuck. Today we're going to hear a life change story, a testimony to bring us hope. Welcome to Celebrate Recovery Official. This is a podcast that uh, shares life change, hope to help us to walk the newness of life through the Celebrate Recovery principles based on Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus helps us to face those hurts, hangups, and habits and broken relationships so that we can walk in healing and freedom and to really find our purpose so that God doesn't waste the hurts in our life. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with drugs and alcohol and perfectionism. My name is Rodney. I'm the Global Field Director with Celebrate Recovery. Grateful to uh, welcome on Matt. Welcome, Matt. Thank you for having me, Rodney. Yeah. (laughs) So introduce yourself the way you do in CR, man, and we'll jump into a conversation. Yeah, I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. I struggle with lust, anxiety, codependency, low self-esteem, and my name is Matt. Hey, Matt. So, Matt, I, I know bits and pieces of your story and and um, and some pretty pretty good God moments in your story, and, and I appreciate you coming on to share because I think it'll bless people. But, but man, kind of, you know, we talk about Celebrate Recovery. Um, we have these things that bring us in to celebrate recovery. And at the very root of it, it is our pain. Maybe we, we are looking at the habits that got us that have caused havoc, but it's really the core foundation is the hurt that leads to our behaviors and our habits. So man, walk us through, um, you know, we all have a lot of hurt, but there was a couple significant events in your life that, um, in, kind of brought you into this place of, of recovery. Um, can you kind of walk us through to kind of paint a picture of what the hurt looked like in Matt's life, man? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I might, I might start by saying that, you know, I, I came into CR because of, uh, what I thought was just a, just an addiction to, to pornography mm. and sort of little did I know that there's a root uh, for me anyway, uh, yeah. I, won't, I won't say we, but for me, no, yeah, root, no, I think that's a fair and, statement. Yeah. yeah. And so, so yeah, that's, that's what brought me into CR was I, I had this, this habit I could not kick or mm. I thought I couldn't kick with this, with pornography. And, um, that, that habit was picked up when I was a kid. Um, when I was seven or eight years old, uh, my, uh, this is maybe, uh, jumping just right in, I guess. No, that's but, all right. Yeah. Uh, my, my brother and I have a, an uncle that, that we would stay with from time to time. And he one weekend decided that, that it was time for us to, to learn about the birds and the bees. Hmm. And, and part of that was introducing us to pornography. And he, he made it seem like this is what everybody does. Uh, or, you know, every, every guy, this is just what you do uh, mm-hmm. as you become a teenager and kind of throughout life or that's how I heard it anyway. And, and so uh, he introduced this thing to me that, or to us that was like, Whoa, okay, what, mm-hmm. what's going on here? Um, but then he also uh, that night um, as we were sleep or woke us up yeah, as we were sleeping and, and uh, abused my brother and I. Mm-hmm. And so this, these two things happened where this new world was introduced to me. I guess two new worlds were introduced to me. Uh, one was this, this kind of weirdly exciting thing that I didn't know anything about and was too young to know anything about. Mm. And then this other, this other world of, well, here's this guy that was safe or is supposed to be safe. And he, uh, is doing this thing that does not feel right or good. Um, and so, it, it was like this thing happened, but now I know how to go soothe myself or how to escape hmm. this other world of, of pornography that he introduced me to. And so, yeah. um, yeah, so that, 
Well, I was going to say, I mean, that's, and that's hard and I appreciate your vulnerability with that, man. Uh, And I think the, I think it's, what's so important in that is, is we're trying to make sense of the good reasons why we do what we do, not to justify our behavior. And sometimes we, we feel like, Oh, are you justifying? No, we're not justifying, but we're trying to understand the good reasons why. Right. And so here's a seven, eight year old introduced to something that he's not supposed to be introduced to. And so it unlocks this part of you that is, is supposed to be a gift from God. Right. And, and here the enemy comes in and hijacks this gift. Right. And now you're kind of introduced to this and you're seeing and experiencing things that I would imagine creates a ton of confusion, Mm -hmm. uh, shame in that. Or what were you experiencing that if you're trying to put some words to that? I, I think shame, yes. Uh, I think just my world was kind of, I, I don't really know what to, I mean, you know, that's hard for a, yeah. an 18, 28-year-old, whatever, to process, let alone an 8-year-old. So, Was that 8-year-old feeling good about himself? Was he feeling bad about himself? No, I, I, I remember feeling bad about myself. And I also remember... Uh, my brother and I did not talk about this. So we, we didn't know that it had happened to each other mm. until we got into our thirties and we finally wow. talked about it. And so, which that then created in me this sense of, well, I'm, I'm broken. I'm, yeah. Uh, Can't let anybody know about this right. or into this. Right. Yeah. Wow. I also thought my uncle saw something in me and not my brother that he thought he could do this to me. So I'm, mm. I'm the weaker, I'm the lesser, i we're, we're identical twins, uh, for those that don't know, I suppose. And so yeah. I saw my brother as like, he's the, he's the standard and I'm just trying to catch up to him. Yeah. And so that, that I've had that, or I had that thought or that, um, mindset for as long as I can remember. And mm. so when this happened, it sort of affirmed or confirmed that thought in me that, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day about this and I said, uh, it, it was a toy, uh, it was like a toy maker hmm. and I was toy. I was the, the first, uh, uh, what's the word? I, I was, uh, the first toy that he made hmm. and then he got it right with my brother, toy number two. Oh, wow. Know? So I've got, uh, I've got all the mistakes and the weaknesses and the, this, their discoloration and whatever else. Wow. So that's a lot. That's a lot for a seven, eight year old. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> You're, you're talking about a seven, eight year old can't process that, but isn't yeah. that amazing that even as a seven, eight year old, which I mean, we, we have a greater understanding than we realize in those childhood years, those growing up years that you, you had a pretty good picture of shame. Yeah. You couldn't call it shame. Right. It's like, well, this is shame that I'm dealing with, right. <laughs> but man, what a hard place. And so you, so not only, and this is so significant that it's not just what happens to us. It's that no one can be there for me. Mm -hmm. Right. Which kind of adds to that traumatic experience. Right. So, so you're carrying this now as a seven, eight year old, um, really most of your life. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I can't let anybody know about this, including my brother, which you're pretty close to your brother. We are. And just watching your relationship, it's a sweet relationship. Uh, but man, that, that kind of articulates the, kind of the severity and the weight that that kid was carrying yep. and it, kind of a sad place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so man, you're, you're carrying that. You're trying to, you're trying to mask that, try to act like there's nothing there. Um, did, did this happen multiple times? Was a, it, it, it was a couple times, uh, over the span of a few months, probably. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know why it was just twice and I don't, I don't you know, I don't don't know. And even just, just twice. Right. Yes. yes, Yeah. No, I get what you're saying. I I mean, thank God it didn't happen more, but once is too many. Right. Um, Right. So, so man, so you carry this, that he's your, your uncles abused you a couple of times and, and you're carrying this. How did this, um, obviously you've already let us into pornography became a part of your, your life now did did pornography kind of take off immediately pretty rampant from that point forward or did it was it delayed or what 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 did that look like there was there was a slight delay maybe uh, just because of access yeah um, 
but a little bit different back then. A little bit different yeah. back then. Yes, yeah. I'm old enough to didn't say have that. the internet. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we, I, I can remember, you know, even as a kid, my TV in my room, uh, it, it, you know, got the fuzzy channels, and and so there was some access at night, and then we got a family computer, and for whatever reason, we put it in my room, <clears throat> and mm. so, yeah, internet access became pretty red, readily available at that point, and um, and and so because I had this low self-esteem or, or low view of myself. Um, I, yeah, I just knew how to go back to the, to escape to the world of, of the internet and pornography. And so when I was feeling bad about myself, I can even remember in eighth grade, which is funny now to, to talk about, but we had a, a who's who voting, you know, class clown, most likely to succeed. And my brother, my twin brother won best looking, <laughs> and yeah so now it's it's funny now and he brings it up every now and then like, wait what at me. Yeah. we look identical but i yeah. i again that that uh confirmed that well he's the better twin mm. you know and so that happened and and just crushed me which Man. is funny to say now but when that after that crushing it, it you know i thought well i can still go back to my computer and i can i can soothe myself via the yeah. via the world of the internet um, that will bring me comfort and, and I will be somebody yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. And, which is just a lie from the enemy, but right. it is interesting how he kind of hooks us in, you know, that we talked about that. Just if you, if you're feeling weak, I'll make you feel strong. Right. If you're right. feeling hurt, I'll bring you comfort. Here's some solutions. And it's like, ugh, that's, yeah. that's not a good place. Yeah. So as if that wasn't enough, you're carrying that you're now, in, you know, deep in a pornography addiction, uh, trying to make sense of this, these doors that have been open Mm -hmm. and, and the enemies hijacked even what sexuality is. And, but then there was a a little bit later in life, uh, there was another event uh, as if that wasn't enough, but there was another significant event that a lot of people don't know about, but what, what was that other big event in your life, man? Right. So this, uh, I was in my twenties at this point about 10, 11 years ago. And I was, I had just started teaching in West Texas, Midland, Texas at a, a classical school called Midland classical Academy. And every year this school took a trip we called the adventure club trip and, and it was Labor Day weekend. So the first, we had one week of school and then, you know, that Monday, that following Monday off. And, and so by my, or, my uh, recollection, it was the, you know, whoever was organizing the trip would just say, hey, we're going to go to this location and we're going to, you know, spend a couple nights and we're going to hike and open to students, staff and parents. So my thought was, it's my first first week at this school. I, I know nobody. Hmm. So and, I've, and we were going to Zion National Park. And so I thought, man, what a great opportunity to get to know some people, uh, but then also to see some really pretty country. So. Hmm. Um, the plan was to, to leave at, we left around 1 PM on a Friday. We were going to drive through the night, get to Zion and just start hiking. Mm -hmm. Um, so that we had, gosh, I don't know, 40 to 50 people, uh, all caravanning, um, in multiple, you know, suburbans or whatever. And so in my, in my vehicle, it was myself, uh, a dad, and then four students, and around 9 p.m., I took over driving, and uh, I, I, my brother and I both are, we, we get lost. Uh, I mean, we can get lost in our, our childhood neighborhood. You know? <laughs> That's me. Uh, I'm the same yeah. way. <laughs> so we, we figure it out eventually. But so we, we're driving. I get us separated from the pack. We're still going towards Zion. We're just on a different road than everyone else. Um, so everyone falls asleep in my car, what, 10 o'clock, 10.30 and I'm just kind of making miles. I've got a, two Red Bulls that I'm I'm waiting to open um, until two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. But anyway, I, so sometime around 1.30, 2 a.m., there's nobody on this road. It's just me, and um, no music's playing. Nothing. I I wind up falling asleep mm. driving. And I wake up because I'm hitting the rumble strips on the side on the right side of the road. So that jerks me awake. And we're going about 75 miles an hour. Um, and so I, I, I 
Over jerk the correct. car back yeah, yeah on the left side and as i do that i overcorrect too hard so i jerk the car back uh right and when i do that um that's the last thing i remember uh, mm. i mean now after the fact i know uh that the suburban began to flip i got knocked out um and so i, I wake up and i mean i can still remember how i felt and and mm. you know what i saw but I woke up and it's just dark and I'm looking at a windshield that is just completely shattered. Mm. And I, I remember thinking, where am I? Who put me in this car? That's not mine. And why, why did they put, yeah. Why did yeah. they put me in the driver's seat? And I, I looked behind me and I know now that it was one of the boys that, uh, from the accident. And, um, but I, I remember saying help. And somebody came and kind of let me out or got me out of the car and walked me to another boy who was um, laying down. And he was, I remember him looking up at me smiling and I just kept asking what happened. And, and this guy that helped me out just was very vague and, Hmm. Oh, uh, you know what, whatever happened, happened. It can't be undone stuff like that. And Hmm. I just kind of thought, all right, that tells me nothing. Yeah, I'm still confused. Yeah. So eventually, um, and, and because I don't really, I mean, things were foggy. So by eventually, I mean, either five minutes or an hour, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, paramedics come, we get, uh, this boy and I get in the back of this ambulance and, uh, I asked the paramedic, I said, what happened? And he just very bluntly says, I'm going to tell you right now, two people are dead. Mm. And so he said the word dead and, and it came like a flood of, of memories of what happened, I guess I thought I was the one driving. Mm. I fell asleep and now two people are dead. So because of me, two people are dead and I just start shivering. Uh, yeah. Going into shock. Oh I yeah. Imagine. Oh yeah. yeah. And, and I, you know, at the, uh, in the accident, I lost my phone. And so I grabbed, uh, the dad, uh, cliff was his name his phone was uh, on the side of the road with me. So I just grabbed that real quick and I text everybody, Hey, big accident, tuba city, um, emergency room is where we're going. Mm. And so, uh, you know, not having my phone, I, I knew my brother's number off the top of my head and that's it. You know, you think about it now, nobody knows yeah. those numbers yeah, because no, there's no reason to. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, anyway, we, we get there and getting, uh, admitted into the ER. I knew I was with Colby and he was fine. And I knew Cliff was okay ish. And so I'm trying to think about who these, you know, so I, I, in the ER, I learned that, um, uh, Bryce Kerrigan and Bob Henson, uh, were the two boys that passed away and, uh, which was just, you know, I remember I was laying in the ER and I'm just, I'm crying. I don't know anybody and people are starting to come in. I don't, you know, I don't know who these people are cause it's my first week. And mm. I remember thinking selfishly, I'm going to jail for the rest of my life because I wanted to go on this dumb trip mm. to Utah. Um, and, and so that, you know, that was in my brain of, I mean, I can remember thinking how, how do I get, get out of this? How can I, Mm. Um, this guy that, that killed two boys, how can I, um, what do I, I guess I need to run away and I'll probably never see my family again. Or, wow. I mean, even thoughts of ending my life in yeah. my head and, Whew. um, it just was a lot. And then it is a lot. And then I was coughing a lot. And so they, uh, doctors decided to do a chest x-ray to see, they thought maybe I had a collapsed lung. And, um, so I got this little glimmer of hope. Um, that, uh, probably the Lord was showing me, this is what, this is what, how I'm going to walk you through this process. Um, but my ER or my x-ray tech, his name is Richard Rice. He approached me and he's cool looking dude, super like just tatted up. And mm. he, he had a, a little bit of a rough past, but he just, he walks up and Hey, how's it going? You know? And I said, terrible. Uh, I don't know if you know what's going on. Yeah. But, uh, terrible. And he, he asked me, are you a believer? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, can I pray for you? And I said, yes. And he prayed for me. And he encouraged me to, to write things down over the next several months. And he said, you're not going to want to, but it's going to help you process. And you can look back on it later. Hmm. 
Hmm. Um, so he prayed for me, did the x-ray, um, go back to my holding spot there. And, um, I was in the ER for maybe three, four hours and got discharged. And as I'm getting discharged, the doctor says, you know, yeah, you're, you're free to leave by the way. You're right. Your, your kidneys popped up on the x-ray and there's something on your right kidney. It looks like it could be cancer. Get it checked out. Bye. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Um, but I remember thinking, I mean, I had, uh, two opposing thoughts. One was I, I need to figure this out. Mm-hmm. But then the other one was, well, this is my way out. This is my escape. I don't, I can, uh, I can let this, I don't have to tell anybody and I can just let this cancer grow and that'll be my way out. Wow. Whew. That's a lot, man. <laughs> I mean, in and of itself, so the accident, but now you're facing possibly cancer and, yeah. um, well, I want to take a quick break and I want to kind of, kind of understand how you process that and, and where it took you and, and, um, uh, hard story, man. I appreciate your vulnerability. And, and when we come back, we'll we'll finish that conversation talking with Matt, and um, we'll be right back. Stick with us. Hey, friends, if you're looking for an additional meeting, we would absolutely love for you to join us for our global online open share group every Wednesday at noon Pacific. Uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. All you got to do is go to CelebrateRecovery.com and find the link and you can join us and have a a safe space to process your hurts, hangups, and habits, some victories or struggles that are happening throughout the week. Go to CelebrateRecovery.com for more information and join us on our Wednesday online open share meeting. Welcome back, uh, Matt. But but before the break, uh, you kind of just dropped a big bomb on the table right this um you're dealing with the reality of two people um being gone uh, due to this car accident and now these x-rays are showing uh, what could be cancer can, can we just make sense of what i mean you're you're throwing a lot at us i know this has been your story for a while but our listeners are kind of taking this in and i'm it's kind of hitting me and i can feel that in my my body as you're bringing it in just how heavy that is but can you put some words to that what what was that place like for you man if uh, that's not a good space to be in what what is that if you're putting some words to what that place is like now as you reflect back on that Uh, the, the first word that comes to mind is hopeless um I, I just, I just felt alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but also kind of like I deserved it maybe. Um, and, and, um, maybe this is my punishment for yes. what I did. Okay. Yes, yes. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, I just alone and hopeless and, and I, I, uh, it, 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 it again kind of confirmed, well, see, you're, you're the twin that, that this kind of thing happens to. Mm. You're, you're the lesser one. That's why, that's why, you know, uncle Larry did that. And that's why, and now this is happening and now cancer and why wouldn't it happen to me? You know? Wow. Uh, so it it was just that, that narrative. Um, I deserve this. Um, it's just kind of my lot in life, I suppose. I can, I can feel hopeless seems like a good Mm -hmm. fit for what you're experiencing. So all these events are just confirming what you believe about yourself that I'm the lesser. Right. And maybe, maybe I'm just defective and maybe, maybe this is just my destiny. And, Mm -hmm. and so you, you continue this path then of just trying on under your own power, you're a believer, Mm -hmm. but maybe I'm too defective for Jesus or tell me, tell me how this interaction uh, connects with your relationship with the Lord. Um, this, kind of contrast of being a believer, but believing that I'm too defective. And yeah. I, I think until this, up to this point, my relationship with the Lord was, was a kind of transactional in my head. So mm. I need to do a, B and C and, and then God will be pleased with me. Um, kind of earn your love. Yeah. Yeah. His love. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Earn love, earn, earn grace, um, which is completely backwards. Right. But that's, that was my mindset. And so, I think when the accident happened, um, 
there was there was some how like there's kind of no coming back from this. I don't, I'm not sure what to do, where to go. And, and even can I trust the Lord? Like, why would he let this happen? I, I know there were, there were, there was some time of being angry at God uh, mm. because I, in my head it was, I'm just going on this thing. This is a totally innocent thing to go and, and get to know these parents, get to know these, these students and staff and uh, you know, kind of a, why would you allow this to happen? Mm. God, uh, and especially to me, like I'm not a, I'm not some strong, yeah. you know, uh, I was maybe strong on the outside, but, but emotionally, mentally, spiritually, uh, I was just this weak little kid. And, and so it's, it was like, God, why are you doing this? Mm. Uh, and, and can I even ask you that question? Do you, can I trust you enough to answer that question? Or, um, can I, can I trust you enough to, to come to you with, with these feelings of anger and doubt and uh, just, and whatever else I was feeling at the time, it, it, it was, wow. it was a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So was it cancer? So it, yes, ca- came back confer- confirmed that it was cancer and I, I had surgery. Uh, even that whole process was, uh, you know, part of the, part of the reason I even got the, the cancer confirmed or the, my kidney checked out was because the, the parents of the younger boy who died, which I could, I can go into that, but they, uh, I'll fast forward really quick, but they were every week, uh, uh, his mom, Amanda Kerrigan would text me, Hey, what's going on with your kidney? Hey, have mm. you gotten your kidney checked out yet? What's going on? You better go get it checked out. So I did eventually in uh, there. So in, can I stop you right there? Cause yes. that, that's gotta be a, an interesting dynamic for you. <laughs> it's like, why is she concerned with me? Right. 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 I mean, what, how do you make sense of that? Yeah. And this woman is actually worried about you yeah. based on her own pain. Right. As you yeah. kind of bring me into this story, how do you make sense of yeah. that? So we're, we are, I get discharged from the, from the, from the ER and we're flying back eventually. And, I remember uh, a friend of these parents wanted to, uh, he, he was on this plane with us and he said, Hey Matt, um, the Kerrigans want to, want to meet with you. I know they want to meet with you. And he just kind of said, give me your number. And anyway, we set up a meeting. So the accident happened on a Saturday morning and that following Monday, Tuesday, I was at their house. My, my family had come down to Texas too, but we, so we were at their house and on the way there, I just remember, I mean, my, I was sweating and mm. I, I just so, anxious. what was your fear? What, well, and that anxiety? What it just, were you? I, I just thought, I don't, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say. Mm. I, I want to say, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry is not weighty enough yeah. for the situation. What do you say in a yeah. situation like that? I, yeah. I wasn't quite sure other than him saying they want to meet with you. That's, that was all I had. So it, it, in my head, it could have been, they want to meet with you and they're going to, they're going to punch you in the face or whatever. Yeah, the they're, worst they're case. They're going to berate you. And, um, and so I just wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what my response should be. I wasn't sure what they were going to say. Well, and it makes sense too. I mean, th- you know, the, that I deserve the worst punishment. Right. And probably if they do punch me in the face, so to speak, right. And, and you probably weren't thinking that literally, no, no, but, no. but just that idea of, you know, whatever they give me, I deserve yeah. based on what you were just describing. Right. That's gosh, what a hard place, right. man. Right. Yeah. I'd be sweating too. Yeah. 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 So that, that was my thought. Um, I'm, I'm going to get yelled at or yeah, they're, they're going to make me feel bad, but they can't make me feel as bad as I already feel, mm. you know? So we, we get to the house and, uh, um, there was a woman kind of keeping track of everybody that was coming and going and, my brother remembers this, but I told her my name and, and she almost dropped her iPad and they see that Danny and Amanda Kerrigan and they make a beeline for me. Mm. And I mean, arms are, arms are open. They come and just give me the biggest hug that anybody's ever given me, you know? Wow. And, um, they both, they both forgave me and told me they love me. And, and Danny prayed for all of us and, um, I, I mean, I have memories of, 
of crying and laughing and mm. they didn't want me to carry any shame or guilt. Uh, they knew it was an accident and, you know, they kind of said, we, you know, Bryce is with Jesus. Uh, we're sad that he's not here anymore, but we know where he is. And, and so we're not sad about that. Um, mm. and so that, like that, that whole interaction was maybe a 15 minute yeah. interaction. And I, I can remember leaving, walking out the door and we all just, our, our jaws were on the floor and we're going, what just happened? Disbelief. Yeah. This is not, not at all what I expected. And even the other boy's mom, when I met with her eventually, she, she asked me a couple questions about Bob um, and if I knew exactly what happened, then I just didn't. And she said, well, I don't, I don't know if I need to tell you this, but if you need to hear it, I forgive you. And, you know, I was cried out at this point, but, wow, um, that, that was the response from people. What I, you know, it's, it's just like grace, right? Like what I felt I deserved was a lot of punishment and maybe what I did deserve was punishment. Maybe, you know, I even did a little bit of research and it's like, I should have gotten some fines, maybe, maybe a little jail time. Mm. Um, but what I got was grace and love and forgiveness and, and not just, a, it wasn't just a one-time thing. They, they reminded me of that often, whether I asked for it or not. Yeah. Uh, which is again, like wow. God's grace is this ongoing thing. It's not like God says, all right, I forgive you. Here's grace this one day. But then he, but then we sort of, do something to act outside of that. No, he's still going to extend grace every day, every hour. Right. Um, and so they were, they were just, it, it just flipped my view of God on its head kind of, cause yeah. here, I, I couldn't, I can't earn, I can't earn the Kerrigan's and, and the Henson's love or favor after what I did. Yeah. But they're choosing to love and, and favor me anyway. Yeah. What what an incredible picture of grace. I'm just thinking about, you know, justice. I deserve this. I deserve the worst. But mercy says, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. And grace has given us an undeserved gift. Right. Um, what a what an incredible uh, picture of grace. Um, and even to hear those words, and it is, is, I think, of the prodigal son, just that open arms that you're describing I'm coming home and that embrace. And I love that you connected that with the grace that we receive from Jesus, that you need to hear this. I forgive you. Wow. What a story, a story of life change and hope. Uh, we're going to hit the pause button on this podcast and the story and, and bring you a part two. Uh, so you can hear the rest of the story of, of Matt's incredible journey. Uh, too much to pack into one podcast. So um, make sure you uh, join us for part two to hear how we can turn the corner and hear life change and what God did with all that hurt that Matt brings to the table. Um, but it, thanks for being with us today. I hope you find some encouragement. Maybe you're inspired to, to face your own hurts, your own hangups and habits. Uh, go to CelebrateRecovery.com for more information. Find a group near you. Hey, thanks for being with us. Join us next time. Until then. God bless.